Okay. So today is a day of Ches Nisan, 28th of Nisan, is a historic day. That is because on this day the Rebbe gave a historic talk, historic Sicha. And this historic Sicha was a Sicha that sent shockwaves throughout the whole the Babish community in the world. And we can say that from this point then on, all the activity regarding Mashiach and Gula took on a whole new dimension, nothing compared to what it used to be before. I'm going to go through this with you. Here we have it here in English. So there's two parts to the Sicha. One was almost more like an introduction. And then is the part that I'm talking about, which was uh, where the Rebbe spoke in a very, very emotional way. So the first part of the Sicha, I'm not going to read inside. I'll just go over it briefly. And that is the first one, two, three, four, five pages. I, I, I do we need more? Yeah. I made copies because uh, if you have time to look at it on your own, we have two more copies left. But here in class, we'll do the following. The first part of the five pages talks about how the time, it was, by the way, the same the same setting like this year. It was a Thursday, was the 27th of Nissan, and Friday was the 28th of Nissan. <clears throat> the Rebbe went to the Ohel on the 27th. The Rebbe always goes to the Ohel the day before Rosh Hodesh. And he went on the 27th, he expected that the Rebbe would speak. But when he came back from the Ohel, the Dab in Mincha, then the Dab in Mayru, and then the Rebbe requested the microphone to speak. And what the Rebbe said was something which we'll soon see how, how, uh, how powerful it was and how unusual it was, but first the introduction. The introduction was that we find ourselves now, meaning these days, in a time which is an extremely opportune time for Mashiach. And the Rebbe went through 15 points, which you find in these five pages, different points, why this time is so conducive and it's such an opportune time for Mashiach to come because of this reason. And plus that, another reason. Plus that, a third reason, a fourth reason, a fifth reason. From every see that it's an opportune time for Mashiach to come. It says that the Gemara says that even though Mashiach can come any day and any hour, any minute, but the one month that's the most can come is the month of Nisan. And it's the famous quote, in Nisan, our people went out of Egypt, and in Nisan, in the future, we'll go out of this Golis, which means it's a time that's conducive for us to go out of Golis. So every day of the month of Nisan, we should be like hoping maybe this, this is the year that it's gonna happen, the first day, the second day, the third day. When you come to the 28th, it's like, okay, the window is about to close. There's a window of opportunity now, and it's about to close. So we should be even more intensely speaking about what we can do to bring Mashiach. Another thing to take into consideration, when this Sikh was said, it was after a period where the Rebbe began, and this we learned about in the previous classes, began to quote the matter that says, Higiyaz Mangulas, and the time of your redemption has already arrived. And that began, this is 1991, that began in 1990. And it began with the invasion of uh, Iraq invading Kuwait. In this 
geographic location and everyone will be panicking and Hashem will give a message to the Jewish people, don't panic. Whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it for you. This means that your time of redemption has arrived and whatever is happening is part of the process of Mashiach coming. And that's how it began. And then I was out that we're actually observing miracles now. The miracle that was taking place in Russia with the fall of communism. 70 years of being persecuted, Jews were able to now observe Torah mitzvahs in Russia freely, no different than New York and any place in the United States and any place in the free world. On top of that, the Rebbe pointed to what was going on with Iraq, that we witnessed incredible miracles. Number one, the war itself was a miracle. And number two, besides those miracles that that one, even though Saddam Hussein sent 39 Scud missiles into Israel, that one missile killed one single person. Nobody got hurt, nobody got killed from the missiles. And in fact, the other miracle was that he was threatening or everybody knew that he has done this before using chemical warheads. When chemical warheads, there's no escape because it, it spreads poison in the air and everybody breathes in this poison. I mean, look what happened with COVID. So imagine putting a missile that's gonna spread this kind of poison in the air. And miraculously, he did not do it. Israel prepared with gas masks. Later, the expert, experts said that if he would have used these chemicals, who knows if the gas masks would have even helped. So there were miracles upon miracles. And the Rebbe said, these miracles are part of the process of redemption. And they, actually the war ended on Purim. They thought it would be a very long war with a lot of casualties, God forbid. And it was a war that lasted only for 40 something days. And like I said, in Israel, there were no casualties, not even one. And even among the other nations where they expected 20,000 casualties, remember I read to you from 40,000 casualties, they prepared 40,000 uh, medical uh, personnel and so many thousand beds and so on and so forth, or all or more than some 300 and something people that were killed altogether, which was again, a miracle. After all this, Comes the, comes this these words. So I'm looking here at page five on the bottom. It tells you which page number it is. Page five of ten. This is page five. So I'm going to start with the middle of the page. Because of the unique stress on the redemption at this time, an astonishing question arises. And the Rebbe is asking two questions. One question is, so to speak, addressed to Hashem. The other question is addressed is addressed to us. The first question is, how is it possible that despite all these factors, Mashiach has, which means everything the Rebbe said above about how we're living in such an amazing time that's so conducive and so prone for Mashiach to come, how is it Mashiach has not come yet? Mm -hmm. This is beyond all possible comprehension. It's beyond comprehension. So the next time you hear somebody say, you know why Mashiach didn't come? Because Joe and Shmo are having a fight. And how could Mashiach come when two people are fighting? The Rebbe says no. And that means that what we've gone through and all the good has been done over a period of 2,000 years and everything that didn't have suffered over the 2,000 years has refined us and made us so prepared that there's no reason logically why we're not to have Mashiach. So... On top of all that, the miracles we're seeing, and we're seeing that everything is evolving, evolving, and it's happening, and yet it still didn't happen in actuality. How, how, how does that make sense? Why? Why isn't that happening? It's supposed to happen. Like, you know, the, all the wiring is there. Everything is all set. You press the button, and it's not working. The plug is in. The, uh, the, the uh, mechanic checked everything. Everything is in right place, and it's still not working. So basically, how come Mashiach is not here? That's sort of a plea to Hashem. The second thing is it's also beyond comprehension when Jews gather together, and many more times ten. When the Rebbe was speaking, it was in shul, it was after my and there were probably a few hundred people there. So the Rebbe is saying there are hundreds of people here that gather at the time that is appropriate for the redemption to come, and they do not raise Lammer great enough to cause Mashiach to come immediately. They are, heaven forbid, able to accept the possibility 
that Mashiach will not arrive tonight, and even that he will not arrive tomorrow, or on the day after tomorrow, heaven forbid. In other words, the Rebbe said, I'm looking at the people that are gathered here, and I don't see that people are screaming, shouting, begging, pleading for Mashiach to come, flee over, so maybe next month. In other words, what did the Rebbe really want? The Rebbe was expecting. This was the time that I would say for yeah, a period of eight years, the Rebbe spoke by Fabregn, the Yiddin should shout out with the words Ad Masai. And they'd be made into songs. Ad Masai means, how long do we have to wait? Hashem, send Mashiach now. So the Rebbe expected it. It's, it's month of Nisan. It's such an amazing time. We're all gathered together. And it's right before the new month. Everybody should have been shouting, we want Mashiach now, one way or another. That's what the Rebbe is saying. It should be so desperate and, 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 the, and it should be so urgent and so critical that I can't even wait another day. I need it to happen now. Especially if it's a, a window of an opportunity, don't miss it. And by the way, this also gives another uh, explanation to something that some people question. And that is, when people get together at a wedding, under the chuppah, at a bar mitzvah, at a dinner, at a malava malka, a gathering, for bringing, someone is going to say, what Mashiach now? This one was shout to This thing with Mashiach, I understand, but like, can we like calm down a little bit? Every time you get together, you have to make an announcement. And that's what the Rebbe is saying, yes. All that happened with that night was nobody did anything wrong. It just was a regular night. Everybody got together, but it was a special time. How don't you take advantage of the special time to shout and ask Hashem for Mashiach? I mean, I think of this example, probably everybody read or remembers or was hearing, or maybe you heard him speak. There was a big incident with someone called Shalom Rabashkin who was in jail. And uh, the verdict, uh, how many times they tried, the verdict was for the next 27 years to be in jail. Unfortunately, it was a big tragedy. A man who has a family, even had a child who was a special needs child that needed him very much. And it was a crazy thing. I'm not going into that story. But naturally, whenever his children would be anywhere, they would all say, everybody say, L'chaim, that, and they mentioned the father's name, that Hashem should help him and should be able to get out of jail immediately. Could you imagine him doing that? And somebody would say, you know, enough. I've heard this yesterday and heard this last week. I, I don't have to hear it all the time we get together. So if you're a stranger, you're right. It's annoying every time you come up and need a bracha for him. But if you're a son or a daughter or a, a brother or a sister or a father or a mother, and this very per close relative of you is in jail, whenever you have an opportunity to get a bracha, and maybe that'll be the day and the moment that's going to help, you're going to take advantage of that. You'll never be tired, and you'll never be annoyed, and you never feel that it's too much until the person is out free. It's not too much. In fact, the way it happened was, by the way, just like that. <laughs> Nobody expected it. Nobody, he didn't expect it. He was totally unprepared. They just walked in and said, you're free. He grabbed his Taliesin film, didn't even wait another second to get his clothes and anything else, because what if the door closes? You're free, took his Taliesin film, and ran. <coughs> Trump decided to, uh, to pardon him, which means Hashem decided to pardon him, and he sent the shliach to do it. But basically, that's what the Rebbe is saying. It is an, an opportunity. Take advantage of the opportunity to ask Hashem to bring Mashiach. And then the Rebbe adds, and even when people do cry out Ad Masai, which means until when will be in Golas, when will Mashiach come, they do so only because they were told to do so, because the Rebbe is telling us to do it, so we do it. But are people really feeling that way internally, if they had sincere intent and earnest desire and cried out the truth, Mashiach would have surely come already. In other words, the Rebbe is saying there's two ways for people to cry at Masai or to do something about it. One way is the Rebbe told us to do it, so I'm doing it. It's almost like someone gave me a text and I'm following what it says. And the other way is 
that after they have explained it, why coming of Mashiach is so critical and why it's so urgent, I understand it. And now it's not just because he said, but I feel that when you feel something in a, in a true way, not because someone else is telling you to do it, then you're much more driven to do everything you can to bring Mashiach, to motivate the entire Jewish people to clamor and cry out and bring about all that has been done until now has been to no avail. In other words, everything that ever did, he said, it, it's nothing happened because we're still in Golis. Moreover, we're in the inner exile in regarding to our own service of Hashem, which means internally we're lacking and that's why we're not doing enough that has to be done. I just want to add that well, when the Rebbe spoke, and if you listen to the recording, you hear the Rebbe saying something even harsher. And maybe because it's so harsh, it wasn't put in the written form. Where the Rebbe said, not only that all I've done hasn't helped, but whatever I did was just, he almost used the term like it was, it was it's all vanity. <laughs> How can you say vanity? The things the Rebbe accomplished, you know, millions and millions of people that the life has changed and they put on film and mezuzahs and tzitzis and babies were born and shaduchim were made and health people that were sick became well. I mean, brachas, Jews, non-Jews, there's not enough words to describe all the things the Rebbe did accomplish. But the Rebbe once said, and then that's probably the explanation here, that his goal in this generation is to bring Mashiach, which means all the good that's being done in addition to having an end in itself, like if one person does one mitzvah, number one, one mitzvah to another mitzvah. Number two, even if he would never have an in the spiritual realm, you create a connection to Hashem. That connection is eternal. The act you do down here is a one moment act, it took five minutes or three minutes or one minute. But what the connection you make up there is for all of eternity, it's forever. So doing even one mitzvah has tremendous value. Imagine if you bring a person to do more mitzvahs and more times, but by the Rebbe, in a certain way, it's all still a means to an end, which is even greater. And that is that all these mitzvahs should add so much light that it'll tip the scale and bring Mashiach. So until that happens, in a certain sense, everything is to no avail, everything is vanity. It didn't bring the end result. And, and that's what the Rebbe was, was speaking about with so much emotion, like look what, how much was done and how much was invested. And yet we still don't have the actual end result. And if we don't have the end result, all the good that was done to a certain extent, it, it, it does, didn't, didn't bring that end result. That's addressed to us. Meaning to say, somebody could say, well, okay, we didn't bring Mashiach, but we did this, that, and the other thing. So they're never saying, but if it didn't bring the end result, then don't be satisfied with everything that you did. And we once heard someone give a mushal. I don't know if it's a perfect mushal, but I think it brings out the idea that someone who unfortunately had a family member that was sick and they needed to get to the biggest doctors that they should because the only ones were the biggest doctors in the world that can possibly save this person's life. But who, how could you get to speak to them? No one could even get to speak to them. You need an appointment for months even to get in there. So they used all sort of connections and they ended up speaking to one person who was a big prominent person and that person led him to a bigger person They went to another. Eventually he got to the biggest doctors in the world. And the way he got to them was because he had to get to certain politicians who were, uh, they were the biggest people in the country. And then he needed, um, you know, he needed some, it was a lot of expenses involved. So he got to the wealthiest people that in the world that gave him money, tried to put it all together. He get made million, he got together millions of dollars. He made contact with the most prominent people in the world that people would love to even speak to them one time. And he got to speak to all these people and they're speaking to the doctors and doing everything and they still haven't succeeded in saving the life of this person. Would somebody say, okay, we didn't succeed with that, but you know who I got to speak to? I spoke to the president of this country. I spoke to the prime minister of that country. I spoke to, I, I, was, I was spent five minutes, 10 minutes with Bill Gates. I had with this one, that one. 
it's irrelevant. It's insignificant. The bottom line is, was this person's life saved or not? Until that happens, all this has no say. When it'll lead to the end result that this person's life will save, then we can be satisfied with all these things. So the Rebbe is telling us, as long as we haven't brought the end need to do in this generation, Mashiach, all these amazing it's still not nothing to be satisfied until we bring Mashiach. Again, it doesn't mean let's not be satisfied with the Torah we learned. I'm just talking on an overall uh, <coughs> global level that we have to continue this, this drive to do everything we can to bring Mashiach. All I can possibly do is give the matter over to you. When the Rebbe gave the Sicha, I was actually at home because I have no idea the Rebbe is going to be speaking tonight. Then the alarm goes off. Whenever the Rebbe spoke unexpectedly, the alarm would go off, the one that goes off on Friday. And in my house, we had a hookup. People were able in those days to pay a certain amount of money, and you had a line to 770. If the Rebbe spoke, you would get it on your phone. You can dial a number, and you can hear the phone ringing. So we heard the alarm, turned on the phone, and yeah, the Rebbe is speaking. These are the words I heard. All I can possibly do is give the matter over to you. And I went running to 770 because this was not something that you usually hear the Rebbe say. Do everything you can to bring Mashiach. I'm giving it over to you as if to say, that's it, I, I, I tried my best. Immediately act with all the energy and power to the lights of Toh, but have your needs balanced with the stability of the Kalim of Tikkun. Okay, that part needs to be explained a little bit, but I want to explain the first part. I'm giving it over to you means to say, it doesn't mean to say that I've been saying, okay, out of the picture, you guys take over because I wasn't successful. Let's, let's read the words literally. I'm giving it over to you means that I've been saying, I'm empowering you. I'm giving you the power. I'm giving you the, the bracha that you should be able to do that which you need to do because the Rebbe is saying that he did what he needs to do, and now we need to do our part. And what does it mean, the lights of Toh and the Kalim of Tikkun? We need about a few weeks to explain it fully. And we only have a first Which means there was a light so intense, it could be contained. So the light is intense, can be contained. As a result of that, it caused it, uh, like an explosion up there. So Hashem created the next world, which is at Silas. And that light is not so intense. That light is more measured, and therefore it's containable. When Mashiach will come, what's going to happen is that very same light that initially was so intense and so strong and so powerful that no container could contain it, when Mashiach comes, that light will be drawn down again and we'll be able to contain it in our sort of stable containers. It'll be a stable world, not like that world that fell apart. So the Rebbe is using that language, the way the message has to go. When you tell people about Mashiach, on one hand, you're telling them something really radical, something out of the box. The Mashiach is coming now. It's happening now. So this is something which is like the lights of Toad to certain people. Like, are you out of your mind? Where do you see Mashiach coming? I don't see him. I don't hear him. Uh, the world is just the same. It's actually worse. Look what happened here. And look what happened there. So to many people, this is like radical. It's Toad. But the Rebbe says, you could deliver it to them and you could transmit this message to people in Kalim of Tika, which means in a contained way, in a stable way, in a way that they will be able to understand it. It'll resonate with their understanding and they'll actually appreciate it. And that's our challenge, to take a message which seems to be wow, and but be able to transmit it in a way that people could relate to it and understand it. I once heard two people arguing about this. One person said, you can't tell people that Mashiach is crazy. They're not going to understand what you're talking about. Uh, they want to be able to appreciate it. it it's, it's crazy. Why do you tell the world is going to change and everything's going to be good? Nobody's going to be sick. Nobody will be fighting. Everybody happy. Come on. It's dreaming. So the other guy said to him, is when I was on college campus and the rabbi came to me and said, you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to put a box on your head and another box on your arm and wrap, wrap it around like that. 
I guarantee you that was more weird than telling me there's going to be a beautiful world, that we're going to be happy. That would be so much easier to accept than accepting that this is what God wants. It's like that book I told you. Uh, some of you saw the book. What did God say? You know, I don't know, I don't know if you know why she made that the title of the book. The reason why she made that the title of the book was in her journey of Yiddishkeit, she was in a place in Israel. And Friday afternoon, they said, okay, everybody has to tear up the toilet paper. Tear up toilet paper? <laughs> That's also a service. No, no, you're not allowed to tear paper or toilet paper on Shabbos. So, so this was her reaction. Said, what did God say? He said, we should sit down and tear toilet paper now. So you can really say it about Tefillah. What did God say? Put a box on your head and a box on your arm? Okay, lighting a candle. That I could see. <sighs> <laughs> something really amazing it, it's really but a box on my head and a box on my hand have these garments have strings attached you know it doesn't make any sense you know why it makes sense why? because the time has come that they never told us go out and talk to people about tefillin that means spiritually people are open we have a soul and the neshama is ready to hear what Hashem says and the same with Mashiach. Now is the time that you could go out to people, talk to them about Mashiach, and not only that they won't uh, ridicule it, of course there are people who can do that, but we see for the most part, people actually love the message, they appreciate it, and they want to learn more about it. And that's, and that's because we're living in, in this time, but it's up to us to present it in such a way and not to present it. And by the way, that applies to all the time. You know, if someone says, you like to put on film? The guy says, no, I'm not interested. And you say, give me your arm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are you doing? Don't worry about it. It's, it's a mitzvah. You know, not only it's not a positive thing, it's actually destructive to do it that way. So the same with any. Or because it's an educational thing. It has to be done in a way that people could relate to it. In God's will, that ultimately will be found who, who are stubborn enough to resolve God's consent to actually bring the true and ultimate redemption here and now immediately. Their stubborn resolve will surely evoke Hashem's favor as reflected by the interpretation <laughs> of the verse. There's a passage in Chumash that says about the Jews, they are stiff-necked people. When the Torah says that it's actually a negative thing, they're stiff-necked, meaning that they're stubborn, and they're not, they're not sort of complying with the rules. But here, they never said, we, that nature, being stubborn, we can use in the positive, to be relentless and to do what Hashem wants, and you will pardon our sins and wrongdoings and make us your possession. So basically, why do you have to be stubborn? I think there are two reasons why you have to be stubborn. One reason you have to be stubborn is because when you do something and there are no results, who said this? That the, what's the interpretation of something or other? When you do, you keep doing the same thing, uh, and, uh, and, you have, and you expect the uh, definition of insanity is when you keep doing the same thing, you expect different results. So you got to be insane to keep doing the same thing, talking about the same thing year after year, and it's still not happening, and it's still continuing. So the answer is yes. It's shtus de gedusha. If you know what that means. It's insanity, Kedushadik insanity. But that means you have to be stubborn. And the second thing is you have to be stubborn because the Rebbe saw that it's not going to be overnight. So the second thing is simply ridiculed. There are people who make fun of all the activities. Who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? Who says the time now? And how do you know? And you have to be stubborn not to be intimidated by people's ridicule and so on. As a further effort on my part to encourage and hasten the coming of Mashiach, I will distribute money to each one of you with the intent that you give it to Tzedakah, because in reference to Tzedakah, it says Tzedakah is great since it brings the redemption near. I have done whatever I can. From now on, you must do whatever you can. May it be Hashem's will that there'll be one, two, or three amongst you that will appreciate what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. In other words, sit and think of ideas, what to do, how to do, and uh, may you actually be successful in bringing about the true and complete redemption 
May this take place immediately in a spirit of happiness and with gladness of heart. So in those days when the Rebbe spoke, there was something called hookup. There was no internet, but you probably saw in 770, there's that room that has telephones. And when the Rebbe spoke, there was a, it was transmitted all over the world. In some places, they heard the Sikha 9.30 at night, like we did. In some places, they heard the Sikha 3 o'clock in the morning. Some places, they heard it 4 o'clock in the morning. Some places, they heard it 9.30 a.m. Wherever it was heard, in almost all these places, and over here, I myself, we went, went, we had meetings, literally sitting all night long, sitting and, and debating what can be, what does the Rebbe want us to do? Because the Rebbe didn't say, he didn't spell out, do A, B, C. Just do whatever you can to bring Mashiach. What, what, what should we do? How should we go about? And um, only a week later, the Rebbe did speak by Fabregen and said, the best, easiest way to bring Mashiach is by learning Torah and studying the subject of Mashiach Guru. That has the power to hasten Mashiach's coming. And that's why, that's when we started to institute these classes to learn about Mashiach. Number one, it's something spiritual. When you learn about something like that, it makes it happen. And number two, a lot of the questions people have, a lot of the ridicule, a lot of it is just lack of knowledge. It's a subject that many people don't really study. And there's a lot of, lot of misinformation, lack of information. And as a result of that, people will be negative towards this, that when you start learning and you start studying and you see what it says in the Torah, in different sources, your eyes open up and you realize that this is the proper thing. This is what a Jew should believe and this is the way you should be. So therefore, learning is something which is the most uh, powerful tool that we have to bring the world ready for, for Mashiach. And these last words, I've done whatever I can. From now on, you do whatever you can is the way Hasidim understood this. The way it looks on the surface is, I give up. I do whatever I can. I said this many times, the word give up, the word despair did not and does not exist in the Rebbe's vocabulary. The Rebbe never himself and never allowed anyone else to feel that way or to even think that way. So what does it mean? It reminds me of a story where and I heard this from a relative of this person. It was a person who was a Chabad Chassid, and he was, um, he was uh, in every way following Chabad customs, come to Fabrengen, everything else. He didn't let his beard grow. He had come from Russia, difficult times, and he was a Chabad Chassid without a beard. So they ever called in a certain rabbi in the community and said, I would like you to speak to this person and try to inspire him to let his beard grow, but don't tell him it's coming from me. Okay. So he met with that person and he saw himself that he's devoted to the Rebbe, he's loyal to the Rebbe. The Rebbe's word to him is like that, he'll run to do whatever has to be done. And then he tried explaining the importance of it. Nothing happened, he tried again, nothing happened. A while later, the Rebbe called this person again, this rabbi, and said, what happened with this um, thing that I asked you to do? He said, I spoke to him, but he's not ready to let his beard grow. Then he said to the Rebbe, Rebbe, he is so devoted and loyal. If I would only hint to him that it's coming from the Rebbe, in a moment, he'll have his beard grow. The Rebbe's answer was, who has to let his beard grow, me or him? If he's going to let it grow because I told him, then I'm, let, I'm letting the bed grow, not him. So we're going to wait until he comes to the point where he will decide is what he wants to do. Because that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. How was one single man's beard so important that the Rebbe, who is handling a million things every single day, would be thinking about this one person's beard? Can you help me understand? I can't understand it exactly because I'm not in that place, but it's not only about the bear. We find this with everything and anything. That there are stories about the Rebbe doing things that relate to communities and countries and Israel and so on and so forth. And then there are so many stories of where the Rebbe, you know, was involved with a certain individual. I'll give you an example. One summer I went to Camp Gan Israel for the summer. I used to work in the 
boys yeshiva called Oli Torah, and the yeshiva went out to Camp Gan Israel for the summer. This is in nineteen. 30s and 1930s, 1970s, and he was Lamed. In the 1970s, and there was an older man there, his name is uh, Rabbi Hendel Lieberman, he's an artist, a Hasidic artist, and an older man. And he said to me, eh, want to learn together, a mimer? Okay, you know, it's very, it's very beautiful to learn with people from the older generation. And I used to learn with him every day, I think. One day we're learning, he gets a phone call. This is a thing that I witnessed myself. Gets a phone call, comes back. I didn't ask him what's the phone call. It says to me, that was Rabbi Chadek, the Rabbi's secretary. And Rabbi wanted to know how I'm doing. He was not the head of a school. He was not the head of a shul. He was not the head of, a, of any kind of club. A simple individual. Initially, he told the Rabbi he wants to go to Eretz Yisrael for the summer. And the Rebbe said to him, why Eretz so? Why don't you go to Gan So he went to the camp and they found a place for him. But it wasn't just the Rebbe gave him an idea. Then the Rebbe, weeks later, calls up to ask him, how are you doing? And uh, this happens to a lot of people can testify to this. Stories about how they were individuals. And not only the Rebbe told them something when they came into his room, but how later, sometimes a long time later, the Rebbe inquired um, how they were doing. I have another story where my daughter, the one who teaches here Chumash, when she was an infant, the doctor told us that day he's worried about something. He thinks that there's something there that's dangerous. It's a long story, but the, 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 the thrust of it was that we went, we went to a doctor. Uh, this doctor was so hysterical that he told us we have to do a spinal test immediately. And he called the hospital and told them to prepare and we should go there ASAP. We weren't too excited to do a spinal. It's not such an um, easy um, procedure. So we decided to write to the Rebbe what to do. And we asked, should we just do it or should we get the opinion of another doctor? And the Rebbe said, get the opinion of another doctor. So we went to another specialist and he looked at her and said, eh, change her diet a little bit, she's fine. And, and we said, but the doctor said that at the top of the head, this place is supposed to be soft, and by her, it's tense. So no, I think it's perfect, just good. Okay, now what do you do? Especially when we got home, we were told that the nurse or that doctor who lived around the corner, they were in Albany here, she came to our house looking for us. She said, where are these people? They're supposed to be in the hospital and doing the test. So we wrote to the rabbi. The first doctor said this. The second doctor said that. What should we do? So I said, follow the second doctor. So first of all, that itself was a miracle. The Rebbe didn't speak to a doctor, didn't read a medical report, just getting a note from some hysterical parents. And based on that, he's choosing to tell us not to do that thing. And that happened actually, uh, probably it was May or June. A few months later, as I was walking by to get honey cake before Yom Kippur, the Rebbe asked, how's your daughter? Again, what happened from then till this? Hundreds of people, thousands of people with really serious things. And yet the Rebbe was, was in touch with every individual because that's the definition of a Rebbe. So how he does it, I can't tell you because the only Rebbe can do this. But um, that's what it's about. Anyway, the bottom line is uh, we have to work on bringing Mashiach today so we can spend... Shabbos in Yerushalayim, and um, don't laugh, it could really happen. It could be Shabbos in Yerushalayim. Yeah. Stubborn. Okay. So anything you do, Miftzayim, anything you do ourselves, any achlota, Ed. Another copy? I don't think so. This is the original. No. Sorry, yeah. Okay, a good Shabbos, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.
Sim, vai para o Google. Vai para o Google. Sim. Uh, calma.